believe it's about time to get started tonight. Seven o'clock on the dot. Let's all stand together. Sing a couple of songs here. Charles and Dad's going to leave. 78. He is Lord. Everybody believes that tonight. Let's say amen and amen. Amen, amen. and amen. amen. Okay. We're going to sing the chorus. Just the chorus on the right. All together. He is Lord. He is Lord. He is risen from the dead and he is Lord. Every knee shall bow, every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is born. Because he lives, all 
fear is gone because I know He holds the future and life is worth the living just because it is and life is worth the living just because He
you do it.
lead us in amazing grace. Everybody knows this. Uh, amazing grace, how sweet the sight that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but
Judah in chapter number one, judgment on the nations in chapter number two, and uh, then there's a promise of restoration, chapter number three, Zephaniah, and it's a wonderful short book, and the reason we call these little books minor prophets, it's not because that they're second class books, it's because the material in them are shorter, we only have just a couple of chapters where in the big major prophets, like Isaiah, 66 chapters. Uh, so, but when you get down here to chapter number three of Zephaniah, woe to her that is filthy and polluted to the oppressing city. She obeyed not the voice. She received not correction. She trusted not in the Lord. Well, that's dangerous. <laughs> Trust in the Lord, the Bible said, with all your heart. Lean not unto your own understanding. And all your ways acknowledge him, and he shall what? Direct thy path. path. That's right. They had not trusted the Lord. Her princes within her are roaring lions, her judges are evening wolves. They gnaw not the bones till the morrow. Her prophets are light and treacherous persons, her priests have polluted the sanctuary. But then when you get down to verse number 20, and right above there, Verse number 20, at that time I will bring you again, even in the time that I gather you. For I will make of you a name and praise among all the people of the earth when I turn back your captivity before your eyes, saith the Lord. So there's a promise. There's a promise of restoration. The chief verse we have here, the day of the Lord is near, near, coming quickly. Day of the Lord will be bitter, shouting of the warriors there. Haggai, the small book, written about 520 B.C. You can kind of get an idea of just two chapters in Haggai. Prophecy and hope is to urge the people to complete the rebuilding of the temple. And he wanted them to finish up the temple that they had started. They got sidetracked. If you ever got on a project and just got sidetracked and then all of a sudden you realize, man, i got to get this thing finished up. And uh, there's the prophet Haggai. To rebuild the temples in chapter 1, the blessings of that is chapter 2. And then even David's throne is found in chapter 
chapter number 2. Okay? Zechariah is one of those books that you hear about, a passage mentioned a lot in here, and it's chapter number 14. So have your Bible. Turn to Zechariah, chapter number 14. It talks about the battle of Armageddon. And when Jesus comes back, he's going to be riding white horse. We're going to be riding white horses with him. He's going to speak the word, and the Antichrist and all of his army are just going to melt right in their steps. So it's prophecy, but then it's hope that, hey, the Lord's coming back. 520 to 519 B.C. to give hope to the remnant. So he has visions in 1 through 8. Then there's a messianic prophecy in 9 through 12. Zechariah chapter 9, verse number 9, is one that we always think about when it's Palm Sunday. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion, shout, daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, thy king cometh unto thee. He is just, having salvation, lowly, riding upon an ass. And upon the colt of a fowl, of an ass. And so that's Palm Sunday. But let's look over here at the day of the Lord when he comes back on the battle of Armageddon. In chapter 14, Behold the Lord, the day of the Lord cometh, and the spoil shall be divided in the midst of thee. I will gather all nations against Jerusalem to battle. And the city shall be taken, and the houses rifled. And that carries the idea they'll be robbed. And the women will be ravished, and half the city shall go forth into captivity, and the rest, or the residue of the people, shall not be cut off from the city. Then shall the Lord go forth and fight against those nations. That's when he fought in the day of battle. And his feet, now notice verse 4, when he comes back and touches this earth, it's going to be on a particular place, and it's the Mount of Olives. And his feet shall stand in that day upon the Mount of Olives, which is before Jerusalem on the east. And the Mount of Olives shall cleave in the midst thereof. There'll be a great earthquake when he touches down. Whereas on the east toward the west, there shall be a very great valley. Half of the mountain shall remove toward the north and half of it toward the south. And ye shall flee to the valley of the mountains. For the valley of the mountains shall reach Azel, Yea, ye shall flee like as ye fled from before the earthquake in the days of Uzziah, the king of Judah. And the Lord, my God, shall come, and all the saints with thee. That's why we know this is the battle of Armageddon. We're coming back with him in chapter 14, verse number 5. Shall come to pass that the light shall not be clear nor dark, but it shall be one day which shall be known to the Lord. So it says here in that day in verse number 8, that living waters will come out of Jerusalem half toward the sea, the former sea or the eastern sea, and half of them toward the hinder sea or the western sea. That'd be the Sea of Galilee and the Mediterranean Sea. And it splits and the water goes both ways. And the Lord in verse number 9, and you're going to like this, he shall be the king over all the earth. That day shall there be one Lord and his name one. And so we see here that the day is coming when everybody will worship God. Look down at verse number 12. This shall be the plague wherewith the Lord will smite all the Antichrist and his army. They fall against Jerusalem. Their flesh shall consume away while they stand on their feet. Their eyes shall consume away in their sockets or their holes, and their tongue shall consume away in their mouths. Can you imagine such a scene as when he speaks the word and they're just literally disintegrated right at the voice of the Lord Jesus Christ, right where they stand? And it shall come to pass in verse 13 a great tumult disturbance from the Lord shall be among them. They shall lay hold everyone on the hand of their neighbor, rise up against the hand of their neighbor. 
Now they're so disoriented, they're fighting each other. Instead of fighting us and fighting the Lord, we're following Him. He's speaking the Word, and the people out in front of Him are the enemy, and they just disintegrate or fight each other. And then Judah shall fight at Jerusalem, verse number 14, and the wealth of the heathen round about shall be gathered together, all the gold and the silver and the apparel and the great abundance. And so shall be the plague of the horse and the mule and the camel, the ass and the beast that shall be in these tents and this plague. So he talks there about all that's going to happen when he comes back. Now, when you get down to verse number 20, this is the condition of the thousand-year millennial reign of Christ. Look at verse number 20. And that day there shall be upon the veils of the horses holiness unto the Lord. Wouldn't that be nice to have a veil that had that inscribed upon it? And everywhere you go, you hear these bells ringing, you see these horses... You look at the horse, holiness, holiness, holiness to the Lord. It's about enough to make you want to shout. Woo! Amen. <laughs> he is the holy God, isn't he? That's right. And the pots in the Lord's house shall be like the bowls before the altar. Every pot in Jerusalem shall be holy unto the Lord. And they that sacrifice shall come to take them. And in that day there shall be no more the Canaanite in the house of the Lord of hosts. So Zechariah, one of the great books in the Bible, you don't hear a lot about it, but it does give you some details that Revelation doesn't tell us. Revelation tells us when he comes back, he conquers the Antichrist, yeah. throws him in a lake of fire. But it doesn't tell us that he's going to just disintegrate the army. They'll melt right where they are. Malachi, the last book in the Old Testament, prophecy, judgment, does that surprise you? <laughs> Not all of these prophets are, are judgment prophets. But the one verse that we study a lot when you get into Malachi, it's uh, found in Malachi chapter 3, verse number 10, bring ye all the tithes into the storehouse, there may be meat in mine house, and prove me now herewith, saith the Lord of hosts. If I will not open unto you the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing, there shall not be room enough to receive it. So God promises when we put him first in our time, talent, our treasure, then he takes care of everything else. Thank God for that. Yes. Now we get to the Gospels. We've gone through 39 of the Old Testament books. We have 27 left in the New Testament. This is about a 300 to 400 period between Malachi and Matthew. And so when you get to Matthew's gospel, the gospel simply means the life of Christ. How many gospels are there? There are four. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And they all talk about the life of Christ. Now, there are some apocryphal books written between the two testaments, and they one was the Gospel according to Thomas, but it did not pass the test. It had some errors in it, so they didn't include it. And there's been other Gospels, so-called Gospels, written about Christ. They did not pass the test. We'll get into that one day on how they put the words that were assembled to a test to see whether or not it was inspired of God. But these four books, they all pass the test. Now, what are the Gospels? Well, they include the good news of God's plan for a Savior, the life, the ministry, the death, the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Matthew is our first. Now, what was Matthew before he became a follower of Jesus Christ? Right. He's a tax collector. So, in the Greek language, his writings are pretty good. You can tell he's an educated man. Also called Levi. He wrote about A.D. 60 to show that Jesus was the son of David. He is the rightful king and Messiah that fulfills prophecy. When you get into Matthew's Gospel, you don't go far until you get into a very popular part. 
That's in chapter 3, the preaching of John the Baptist. John the Baptist, in chapter 3, verse 1, In those days came John the Baptist, preaching in the wilderness of Judea, saying, Repent ye, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Then when you get into chapter 4, you have the temptation of Christ. Then was Jesus led up by the Spirit in the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. <coughs> How many days was he tempted? Forty days. Forty days and forty nights, and it was afterward a hunger. I can't hardly go forty minutes without getting hungry. Amen? Yeah. And uh, it's forty days for him. But what did the Lord do? Every time he was tempted, he always used a scripture. He used scripture against temptation. Now, if you'll notice here, the tempter came to him and said in verse 3, If you're really the Son of God, command the stones to be made bread. You're so hungry and you need some of that good bread. And he says here, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Now, if you want to make a note, that's Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse number 3. He uses Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse number 3. Then the devil taketh him up into a holy city. Now what city is that? Jerusalem. Took him up in Jerusalem. Set him on the pinnacle or the highest point of the temple. And he said unto him, If thou be the Son of God, cast yourself down, for it is written, He shall give his angels charge concerning thee. And in their hands they shall bear thee up, lest at any time thy dash thy foot against a stone. For that one you can write in Psalm 91, verse 11. That's the scripture that he used. Then verse 7, Jesus said, It is written again, Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. So the devil took him up into an exceeding high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the earth and the glory of all of them. And he said unto him, all these things will I give you if you'll just fall down and worship me. See, the Bible talks about Satan being the God of this world. And he's trying to tempt Jesus, the creator, by the creation. Satan is a fallen demon. That's all he is, a fallen angel. And he's trying to tempt Jesus to worship him. So Jesus looked at him and said, All these, uh, no, I'm sorry, verse number 10. Jesus said, Get thee in, Satan. It is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. And so the devil left him, and the angels came and ministered unto him. Then when you get to chapter 5, 6, and 7, you have the most popular sermon ever preached. The Sermon on the Mount. And you have the Beatitudes in verses 1 through 12. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. <coughs> Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are they that do hunger and thirst after righteousness. Why? For they shall be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake. You ever been persecuted for giving tracts out? Uh, maybe you've been persecuted for reading your Bible, people laugh at you, praying over your meal, trying to come to church. They don't want to let you off. And you say, well, I'm supposed to be at church at this time. There's a lot of ways that we're persecuted. But the Bible said when you're persecuted for righteousness sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. You've got a place called heaven. You're going to live there forever. Blessed are you when men shall revive you and persecute you, and they shall say all manner of evil against you falsely. For my sake rejoice and be exceedingly glad, for great is your reward in heaven. For so persecuted they the prophets which were before you. Thank God for that. Yes. Then he talks that we're the salt of the earth. Verse 13. You're the light of the world in verse 14. And 
And so Jesus gives this great Sermon on the Mount, 5, 6, and 7. Now when you get all the way back to the back of the book, you have the death, burial, <coughs> resurrection of Jesus Christ. Um, let's look at chapter number 26. Chapter number 26. It says in verse 36, Then cometh Jesus with them into a place called Gethsemane, and saith unto his disciples, Now you sit here while I go and pray yonder. And he took with him Peter and who? James and John, the two sons of Zebedee. And he began to be sorrowful, very heavy. And he said unto them, My soul is exceedingly sorrowful, even unto death. Tarry ye here and watch with me. And then he went a little further. Sometimes we need to just go a little further for Jesus Christ. He fell on his face and he prayed, saying, Oh, my Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as thou wilt. And came to the disciples, found them asleep. Does this three times. Then finally in verse 45, he said, Sleep on now, take your rest. The hour's at hand. The Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Let us be going. Behold, he is at hand that doth betray me. And who was that? That was Judas. Judas betrayed the Lord, didn't he? Then when you get to chapter number 27, it said Judas, in verse number 3, went after he had got to 30 pieces of silver and said in verse number 4, I have sinned. I have betrayed innocent blood. They said, well, what is that to us? We don't care whether you've sinned or not. Yeah. And he took the silver, cast it all the way across the floor of the temple. And the chief priest took the money and said, it is not lawful to put it in the treasury. They took counsel to buy the potter's field. Potter's field was a big field where they would get clay. They would make all kinds of um, you know, clay pottery. So there's a lot of holes there, and they would just take the poor people that didn't have money enough to bury themselves or bury their loved ones, and they'd bury them in this field that was purchased by the uh, deception of Judas. Then was fulfilled the prophecy of Jeremiah in verse number 9. They took 30 pieces of silver, the price of him that was valued, whom thy of thy children of Israel did value, and they gave them for the potter's field as the Lord appointed. So, Jesus stands before the governor, and he stands before the Sanhedrin, and then when you get all the way down here, it says here in verse number 48, chapter 27, verse 48, one of them ran and took a sponge, filled it with vinegar, put it on a reed, and gave him to drink. And the rest said, let it be. Let's see if Elijah comes and saves him. Now, could Elijah come and save Jesus? He could. But we wouldn't be able to be saved. He had to die in our place. He had to shed his blood for our sins. So he could have had him to save him. Could he have saved himself? Oh, yes. I've said many times, he could have taken that cross and turned it into a missile, into a rocket, gone back to heaven and said, I've had enough of this. But he didn't do that, did he? Jesus cried with a loud voice in verse 50, and then he yielded up the ghost. What did he cry out in a loud voice? Remember? It is finished. Great transaction was complete. He made several other comments. Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Remember that? But he yielded up the ghost, and the veil of the temple was rent in two from the top to the bottom. The earth did quake, and the rocks did rent. And notice this the graves were open, 
and many of the bodies of the saints which slept arose. That's amazing. They came out of the graves after his resurrection and went into the holy city and appeared to many. People who had already been dead, maybe for years, came back. And somebody looked around the corner and there was their loved one. Boy, don't you know they were happy to see them. Only God could do that. So they came out of the graves and after he resurrected, the graves opened up when he was crucified and died, but when he rose from the dead on Easter Sunday morning, they all came out of the graves with him. Many of them did. Even the centurion, this soldier, they that were with him, they walked, they were watching Jesus. They saw the earthquake. They saw all these things happen. And here's what he said. Truly that was the Son of God. So the man may have gotten saved. Made a great confession. And there were women there and they guarded the tomb. But that's Matthew's Gospel. Now when you turn to the very back of Matthew's Gospel, he gives us some instruction. If you look in your Bible... It says in verse chapter 28, verse 16. Matthew 28, verse 16. Then the eleven disciples went away into Galilee, into a mountain where Jesus had appointed them. And when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. Isn't that something? How many times has he already appeared to them? Many, many times. And still some are doubting. And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, all power is given to me in heaven and earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even until the end of the world. Amen. Amen. So there's a little outline. The birth and the early life 1 through 4. The ministry of Christ, 5 through 20. The death and the resurrection, the very last week of his life called the Passion, chapter 21 to 28. We just read the key verse. Make disciples, baptize them, teach them all that I've taught you. Then you come to John Mark. Now a lot of people believe John Mark got his information from Simon Peter. And uh, whether he did or not, I mean, there's no one verse that you can pinpoint it on. But there are some indications that that possibly was the was the case. But uh, he did write a gospel, and it is inspired. He was not one of the twelve, by the way. But uh, he wrote from Rome in 58 A.D. to show that Jesus was the suffering Son of Man. See, Matthew showed us that he is the promised Messiah. Mark shows us he is the suffering man. The Son of Man came to seek and to save that which was lost. So it goes right into the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And there are no genealogies in this one. Mark chapter 1 verse 4, John did baptize in the wilderness and preach the baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. John, uh, Mark is a little shorter than the others. One of the passages I like is found in chapter 5. He sees a Gadarean maniac who is demon-possessed. And so, when Jesus, in verse number 6... When he saw Jesus afar off, he ran and worshipped him and cried with a loud voice and said, What have I to do? Now these are the demons in him. What have I to do with thee, Jesus, thou son of the most high God? I adjure thee by God that thou torment me not. For he said unto him, Come out of the man, thou unclean spirit. And he asked, What is thy name? And he said, My name is Legion. Why? We are Many. Some people say Legion 72,000. <laughs> I 
I don't know if he had that many in him or not, but they were a bunch. This man was filled with demons. And so they were nigh to the mountains, and the great herd of swine was feeding there. And the devils, in verse number 12, are demons besought him, saying, Send us into the swine that we may enter into them. And forthwith Jesus gave them leave, and the unclean spirits went out and entered into the swine. And the herd ran down the steep place into the sea. There were about 2,000. So there were at least 2,000 demons. There was a demon in every one of the pigs. And they were choked in the sea. And that's the first case of deviled ham in history. So this man wanted to go with Jesus. But Jesus in verse 19 said, No, you go home, tell your friends. Tell them what great things the Lord's done for you. Now he had compassion on you. All right? That's Mark. Introduction, ministry of Christ, death and resurrection. Key verse, Mark chapter 10, 43 to 45. We read it here in the Bible, Mark chapter 10, 43 to 45. All right? But so shall it be among you. Whosoever will be great among you shall be your minister or your servant. Whosoever of you will be the chiefest shall be the servant of all. For even the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give his life a ransom. Gives his life a ransom for many. So that's Gospel of Mark. We'll stop right there and come back. Look at Luke next week. What profession did Luke have before that he was a doctor, physician? He traveled with a missionary leader a lot, and I'm sure he was very helpful to him. Who was that? Paul. Remember that? He said, Luke is with me. Demas hath forsaken me. So Luke writes what he now he's not one of the apostles either. John's going to be an apostle, and Matthew were an apostle. But uh, Mark was not, neither was Luke. Okay, I believe that just about does it. We'll go ahead and have an invitation here. Charles, if you want to come, let's all stand to our feet. Our heads are bowed and eyes are closed. We'll have a closing invitation. Maybe you'd say preacher, just remember me in a special prayer tonight. As we're dismissed, God knows i got a special burden on my heart, special need. Be with me. Pray that God will touch me. Pray that God will help me. I'll be glad. Anyone like that? You slip a hand up and the Lord knows what's heavy on your heart. Father, you see in our hands, you know our hearts. Yes. We need your help. We need your strength. We pray that you would just take each person here Lord, just do a great work in their life. We know that you're able to do it. Father, we're weak, but you're strong. God, we know that you're able to do it. Nothing's impossible with you. We'll thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. As he plays, if you'd like to come around the altar and pray, you feel free to come. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back now. No turning back. There's nowhere to turn. Nowhere to turn. Nobody to turn to except for Jesus. Amen.